All right, hi everyone. I'm going to talk today about hormone genetic polymorphisms and how to especially use these hormone genetic polymorphisms in clinical practice in terms of predicting response to treatment and personalizing treatment for the uh, patient in question. So we will start with a very brief primer on genetics. Every cell in our body has um, 23 pairs of chromosomes, and which means that every cell in our body has 30,000 genes and a pair of every gene, so 60,000 genes, uh, a pair of 30,000 genes. And all of these together constitute DNA, which comes together in the form of three billion bases. A base is nothing but each of these letters. So what we are going to talk today about is um, changes in one out of these three billion bases. Everyone is aware of uh, genetic mutations, so I'm going, to talk, uh, I'm going to focus more on the difference with regard to genetic polymorphisms or variants. So compared to mutation, these polymorphisms are widely prevalent in the population. They are present in healthy people and uh, people so com completely present even without disease, which means that they don't manifest in a phenotype per se. So they are subclinical, they cannot be identified ex except with the use of a genetic test. Why is this important? Because w today we have come out with um, a branch of medicine called personalized medicine or precision medicine, which uses these genetic variations common among the population to personalize treatment strategies for the patient to improve treatment outcomes, one, and to reduce adverse side effects in these patients. So we will start with uh, female infertility and how we use genetic polymorphisms in women. And here we are going to talk mainly about the FSH receptor polymorphism and the polymorphism in estrogen receptor type 1. FSH receptor is expressed in uh, follicular genesis right from primary follicles and preantal follicles. And this is responsible for the AMH secretion as well uh, by these follicles. The FSH receptor and estrogen receptor type 1, um, when these variations are present, it leads to poorer response in women for controlled ovarian stimulation during IVF protocol. What this means is it results in low antral follicle count, low number of follicles recruited, low number and quality of oocytes retrieved, as well as increase in days of stimulation for these women. And recently it has been found that why this is so is because when the FSH receptor variation exists, it leads to decreased downstream signaling and decreased gene transcription and gene, further gene expression in follicular genesis. So over the last 20 years, there have been several papers talking about the FSH uh, receptor genetic variation, so I'm not going to go deeply into that. Uh, now we have even meta-analyses that show that uh, an increased 61% increase in poor response among women that carry the FSH receptor genetic variation. So a very brief, uh, just one look at a paper as an example where these uh, authors managed to get equal number of follicles and oocytes across the presence and absence of genetic variation in FSH receptor. So what is striking here is, as I said, there are two copies of a gene, so I'm going to keep talking about one uh, variant copy and two variant copies. So when there was one variant copy, they had to use significantly increased amount of FSH to achieve the uh, same response as in wild type women. And when there were two copies of the variant, it was even higher. Okay. And now about ovulation induction. I don't want to really talk about the controversy of uh, use of plumifene citrate and uh, whether or not it's tied to uh, cancer, but I'd like to mention that uh, uh, about two years back, there was this publication, uh, a couple of publications uh, in a longitudinal U.S. study of over uh, of about 10,000 women, and these women were um, studied from about 1965 to uh, 1988 on, uh, and followed up to 2010, and they did not find an increase in the incidence of ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer in these women that could be directly tied to uh, clomiphene citrate use. However they did found a significantly increased risk of ovarian cancer in women that remain nulligravid after use of clomiphene citrate. Now, why did I bring this up is because there are also a couple of uh, papers from two different groups now that have taken normal gonadotropic and ovulatory women. A large proportion of these women have PCOS, and they found that clomiphene citrate usage 
uh, led to clomiphene resistant anovulation and this was very clearly tied to the presence of the FSH receptor polymorphism. So women with FSH receptor polymorphism, they are more likely to be clomiphene resistant anovulatory and with lower chance of uh, ongoing pregnancy. So for the very first time, let us look at some Indian data with regard to G uh, these genetic polymorphisms uh, among our population. So we have taken a cup uh, so we are a molecular testing lab, which means that we get usually patient population, and these would be from couples visiting infertility centers. So these are couples being evaluated or undergoing treatment for uh, infertility over the last two months. The uh, total size was 102 patients, uh, 60 women, 62 women, and 40 men. So now first, let's start with women. The global prevalence is in gray, and uh, Indian data is in color. So the FSH receptor variation is present in 41% of the population globally and in 36% of the population among Indian women that were attending the infertility clinic. Estrogen receptor type 1 genetic variation in 45% of women globally and 49% of uh, Indian women. However, what we should be focused on uh, clinically is the genotype prevalence because this takes into account the copies of both genes together as a pair. And in this case, with one and two variants of FSH receptor globally, it was 65%, and in the Indian population, again, 65% prevalence. In estrogen receptor type 1, we wouldn't really classify the presence of one genetic variant as poor responder. We would classify only uh, when the variation in, is present in both copies of the gene. And therefore, globally, it's at 20%. It has a um, one and a half times increase in the Indian population seen at about 30%. Now, we have to put the FSH receptor and the estrogen receptor type 1 genetic variations together to, be of, uh, to form any clinically useful opinion and how to treat these patients uh, in practice. And so putting them together, about 20% of the entire population had completely wild type, uh, so they did not have any genetic variations that would lead to subfertile subfertility. However, 80% of the population did have that. And for 41 women, we had indications saying uh, prior IVF uh, failures or poor response to controlled ovarian stimulation. Among these women, two-thirds had uh, FSH receptor variation, and a third had uh, variation in estrogen receptor type 1. Putting them together, two-thirds had genetic variation in FSH receptor and estrogen receptor together. On this slide, please don't focus on the A, T's, G's, and C's. Instead, you can just focus on the color. Green is for favorable response, and uh, orange is for poor response. Okay, so ideally, the way to use personalized medicine or precision medicine clinically would be a priori. So when women attend the clinic, you would be looking if for genetic variations before you initiate or decide on the treatment strategy. And this is because you can predict treatment success, uh, having the knowledge of these genetic variations, and then personalize the treatment strategy for the particular patient. So as I said, over the last two decades, there are now, there's now uh, a lot of literature that covers healthy women in oocyte donation programs, women with PC COS, endometriosis, tubal factor fertility, and across the spectrum of normovulatory to anovulatory. Uh, I will just mention about uh, variant LH beta. So what happens in this is this genetic variation leads to uh, a less bioactive form of the luteinizing hormone. However, we don't have enough data on this, so I don't, I'm not going to talk about uh, the variant LH beta. But it would be a classic case where if this variation was detected, then you would uh, include LH in addition to exogenous FSH in the ovarian stimulation protocol. <laughs> okay. Now we are moving on to male fertility and the use of these genetic variations in treating men. And this covers, again, the entire spectrum of men from azoospermia severe to moderate oligozoospermia, as well as normozoospermia with poor sperm quality, especially uh, with regard to high DNA fragmentation levels, morphology, and motility defects. So the FSH receptor is the same genetic variation that also affects men leading to subfertility, but in addition, we are going to look at the FSH beta subunit. The FSH beta subunit codes for the FSH uh, beta of the hormone, and this genetic variation leads to decreased activity of the hormone. Uh, it leads to about 20 to 40% decreased levels, which wouldn't uh, be clinically considered as extremely low, so that's why, again, uh, a genetic test would be necessary to find out if uh, the patient carries this genetic variation. 
So why is this important and why are we looking at it is because a lot of men are subjected to FSH therapy. Some of them respond to uh, FSH therapy very well, some of them don't respond at all. So how great would it be if we can pre-identify and pre-select these men and just treat the ones that would actually respond to FSH therapy before giving them this. A couple of very classic studies were performed with regard to this where they uh, gave FSH therapy to men and then they genotyped these men for uh, genetic variations in FSH receptor and found a dramatic and significant improvement in several sperm parameters but only in men carrying uh, one or two copies of the genetic variation and not in men with, uh, that were completely wild type. Very similar results also with FSH beta subunit genetic variation in men carrying one or two genetic variants, dramatic improvement, but not seen uh, in men without the genetic variation. So the same data put on uh, graphical form, 70% of men with FSH receptor variation uh, responded very well to FSH therapy, whereas only 10 men without the genetic variation responded. And if you compare that to the placebo group, 10% of men in the placebo group responded, which means that you might not even give these men FSH therapy to start with. In the FSH beta subunit, even more dramatic, 100% of the men had a doubling of sperm count, and two thirds of them had restoration to normal zoospermia. So, and there have also been cases of spontaneous reproduction uh, after FSH therapy in these men. Both studies followed the similar protocol of 150 international units three times every week for three months uh, to lead to this dramatic improvement. Now, DNA fragmentation. A couple of recent studies have found a link between DNA fragmentation levels and the FSH receptor polymorphism. What they have found is the presence of FSH receptor polymorphism increases the risk of DNA fragmentation in these men by 16-fold. Now, if you look at the uh, first DNA fragmentation level percentage, it's completely normal in men with wild type, whereas in men carrying one or two copies of the variant, it's significantly increased. And the number of people with uh, DNA fragmentation, with high levels of DNA fragmentation, 80% of men with FSH receptor variation had high levels of DNA fragmentation, whereas only 15% of men uh, who were wild type had high levels of DNA fragmentation. So looking at the male uh, prevalence in the Indian population, 41% in FSH receptor globally and 36% of Indian men who visited the uh, infertile, infertility clinics and uh, came to our attention. Among the FSH beta subunit, the global prevalence is 8% and the Indian prevalence is 5%. So everything matches uh, very closely, everything follows very closely with the global prevalence. But as I said, we would be looking at the genotype for any clinical relevance where we put the pair of genes together. And here, 65% global prevalence, 67% uh, prevalence in FSH receptor in the Indian population. In terms of FSH beta subunit, 16% globally and 10% in the Indian population. So, of course, when you are going to use FSH therapy in the clinic, the decision would be based on the presence or absence of both FSH receptor as well as the beta subunit genetic variations put together. So among the entire population of 40 men, 30% were completely wild type, not indicated for FSH therapy based on these genetic variations. However, 70% would be eligible and would be expected to show a certain degree of successful uh, response on FSH therapy. So only 20 of these men came to us with indications saying uh, severe to moderate oligosuspermia or azospermia. Among these 20 men, 92% of them had genetic variation in the FSH receptor. So that's uh, dramatic and it was a surprising statistic for us. So you would, be, you would consider men across the spectrum of azospermia to normal zoospermia for uh, testing for FSH receptor and beta subunit genetic variations. And this includes uh, poor sperm quality in normal sperm count, which can uh, traverse mobility, uh, motility, morphology, as well as DNA fragmentation levels. And how can you use this clinically is to predict the sus uh, uh, success rates of FSH uh, therapy in these men and therefore to personalize treatment strategies in them. To summarize, we have seen that genetic polymorphisms that are
prevalent in other populations are also prevalent in the Indian population and these polymorphisms can be used uh, to improve treatment strategy and success rates especially in women uh, prior to ovulation induction and ovarian stimulation using gonadotropins and also in men across uh, the spectrum of sperm count and poor sperm quality. In addition, I want to uh, just give a glimpse of where personalized medicine is going in future, and this is with regard to several obstetric complications. There have been genetic variations that are now tied to preterm labor, uh, premature rupture of membranes, urinary incontinence, cervical incompetence, and how to manage uh, these better. So you would be predicting the risk of these uh, in advance and then helping manage these patients a lot better. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Dr. Kamini Rao, and thank you very much for listening.